Hey guys, welcome back. So I had the privilege of chatting with James Toesland, a two-time world superbike champion and ex-MotoGP racer. But my path with James actually crossed a long time ago when he was competing on the world stage against my brother, which we chatted about in our interview, along with James's racing career, his music career, and what he's up to now. So stay tuned for my interview with James. Alrighty, well, hello everybody and hello James. Thank you so much for taking part and having a chat with me. How are you going? Hey, I'm very well. It's an absolute pleasure not talking to each other for over 15 years. I think it's about time we had a bit of a catch up, right? It's crazy talking about that before and thinking, oh my God, the last time I saw you was like I was 15. That's crazy but you still look the same to me I think I'm a little bit taller now which is good but you still look the exact same oh um, thank you very flattery will take you everywhere <laughs> <laughs> so for those of you who are listening and you're like okay who's James well where have you been have you been living under a rock but I'm going to run through your resume which is really really impressive I was doing some research before and I'm going oh my god look at this look at this so James, you're a two-time World Superbike champion, 2004-2007. You hold the record for the youngest World Superbike championship ever, being the youngest. Former MotoGP racer, you're a musician, a singer, an author, a property developer, a commentator, and a TV host. Is there anything that you can't do? <laughs> Crikey. Um I, I tend to stick to stuff I am good at. Uh, I, I, I'm a very competitive person naturally, so I stay away from anything that I'm absolutely rubbish at. So, um, but, um, but yeah, I've had, a, I've had an eclectic life, I must admit. Um, I'm 43 in a few weeks. And um, looking back over those years, you know, um, it's, been a, it's been a journey and it's been really fun. And to, to, to kind of be introduced to two things mainly that I absolutely adore in life with motorcycle racing, and music, I feel really fortunate that in my life, um, I had the people that did those two things. My, my stepdad did the bikes and my gran was a, a lovely piano player. And uh, I'll be forever grateful of, of being in a family that uh, was able to introduce me to, to those two. Oh, that is so cool. It's so cool from a young age that you found your passions and you found what you wanted to do with life. So let's rewind the clock. Let's go back to young James. Tell us about how you got into racing. Has it always been a passion of yours? Because I heard your story isn't quite the same as most people who get into racing. No, it was a real weird one. I was first playing the piano from six years old and my gran was teaching me and I was I was loving it. And I was, got all these dreams of going to London College of Music and being a professional musician. And I've got it all planned out. And then my mum went out one evening to the pub, met a biker, brought him home, dated him for a few years, and he bought me a TY80 trials bike when I was eight or nine years old. Trial and um, and that's where the paths kind of then slightly changed. I say slightly, dramatically changed from going from a a, a geeky, nerdy, uh, glasses, braces, spots. I had the whole shabam uh, piano player at school. Uh, with hardly any friends, to then coming after Christmas to school and everybody saying, oh, what did you get for Christmas? I went, oh, I got a motorbike. And I'm not kidding you. I must have doubled my friendship group. I was instantly a lot cooler. And um, I had a girlfriend for the first time. And I thought, hang on a second, this motorcycle racing uh, or riding might be the way to go because I, I wasn't really doing much with the piano playing at that time. But uh, um, so that's how it all started. And that's where the infatuation came from. I was naturally competitive, so I'd luckily found something that I could just channel all of that. And no matter how fast I went, I always wanted to go faster, and it was just a, a wonderful existence. And so I've got, yeah, my stepdad to thank for that. Oh, that's such a cool story. I love that, and I can totally <laughs> imagine that. Once you get that bug for the speed and the adrenaline, it is just I'm going to do whatever it takes to keep that happening, right? So tell us then, I'm guessing that you went through the national championship in England, and then I know that you went through to the world championship with World Super Sport and World Super Bikes. Can you tell us about that transition from the national championship then to the world championship? Yeah, we were really, well, I was really fortunate because we didn't have a great deal of money in the family at all. So I went from junior road racing in 1995 
and in that particular year, I was riding with Steve Brogan and James Ellison, who kind of went on to do great things as well. And then I went on to Super Teens um, in 96. And then in 97, it, it was all going to stop because we had some family problems. I lost my stepdad, unfortunately, and, and I had no one to take me to the racing. And and that was pretty much it. And But there was a, a race team in my village, like which was the absolute saviour of, of my career because it, it was going to end. And they, they knew about the situation and they said, well, you can join our team. We'll take you. Um, you can just jump in the van and ride a CB500 and a 600 in 1997 called Mick Corrigan Racing. And uh, that particular year, I won nine out of 10 races for the CB500 Championship. I finished in the top three, I think it was, in the Super Sport Championship after starting it only halfway through the year. And um, I then got propelled because of that into the World Championships at um what's that 17 years old uh so i was lucky that i got really good really quickly because with this team we couldn't really afford to pay this team for one more year anyway so 1997 being taken to the racing by this particular team actually carrying on my career and then giving me an opportunity to showcase my skills to a certain level that i got then promoted straight away in 98 to the world championships was the reason why I had a professional career. And honestly, if that year hadn't have happened, it wouldn't have even been financially possible. So it was it was crazy how quick it kind of developed, but it had to. Wow. I remember reading something as well. You went from going into the World Championship, then you went back into BSB. Is that correct? Before yeah. you headed back into World Superbikes? It was, yep. Yeah. So I had two years with Castrol Honda in World Supersport and they weren't the most successful. Uh, the, the Honda wasn't that competitive that year and the Michelin tyres that were on, the Dunlops were more successful or competitive at that point with the Ducati and Suzuki and Yamaha. They were a little bit more competitive in our package and um, I broke both my ankles uh, in round two as well of that campaign. So I was out most of my first year. I also tragically lost my teammate in that same weekend, uh, Mika Pake um, at Monza. And it was a real baptism of fire when I first joined the World Championship um, Circus. And because of all of that, I lost my opportunity in Supersport after those two years and came back in 2000 to British Superbikes with uh, now, you know, unfortunately, we've just lost Paul Bird um, last, uh, last week. And... Um, I joined his team and I was his very first superbike rider in British Superbike with the Vimto Honda team. And I was 19 years old in British Superbike, which was unusually quite young for, for then. And I was finishing in the top six on, on, on the Honda, um, racing against the greats like Neil McKenzie and Neil Hudson and Chris Walker. And it was it was a fabulous year. But I only did half of that year because I got really badly injured again. I broke my femur really badly. So that was a real setback. But... What I did in that half a year with Paul Bird just was able to showcase the, the, the potential there. And the, the team that won the British Superbike Championship in 2000 was GSE Racing, and he, Neil Hodgson won it. They were going to World Superbikes the following year. They were promoting themselves, the whole team, and they needed a young, cheap teammate for Neil. And um, fortunately for me, even with the broken leg, they signed me at Donington Park on the crutches, for a two-year deal in World Superbikes. So at 20 years old, I was in World Superbikes. And I think also, even though the Supersport wasn't that successful, the campaign in 98 and 99, I'd still ridden the tracks, I'd still travelled, and I and I was still experienced enough for the for the GSE team to think, even though, you know, um, he, he's, you he, know, the potential is, is not really showing at the World Superbike level yet. He, he's got that experience that he did those two years, which I was really thankful for. Do you find that having that two-year experience back with Castro Honda definitely helped you then? Because the transition going from a, nat uh, sorry, a national series to a world championship is quite a big jump. Like you said, you're riding circuits that you haven't been to before. You're in different time zones, different languages. So you find that two-year period before definitely helped you to succeed further in your world championship campaign? It, it definitely did. Uh, to, to know the circuits is probably on, on team managers' uh, list really high up. Um, uh, obviously, you need the speed and the talent and, the, and, and uh, you know, the potential, but the experience of being able to travel around the world, knowing where the hotels are and the tracks and the, the cultures and the different food and the temperatures. Uh, but the main thing is knowing the racetracks because I remember when I went to MotoGP in 2008, um, 
I think I had to learn seven or eight circuits I'd never been to before. And, you know, when you're against Valentino Rossi, Danny Pedroza, Casey Stoner and blah, 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 and you're in the garage and you're going, I wonder if it's left or right out of the garage. <laughs> it's like, yeah. you know, <laughs> you can, can you imagine how much of an advantage it is that Valentino Rossi's got over you? Um, where you're wondering what gear is the turn one? I wonder what gear turn three is. Like it's just it's just a vast uh, uh, difference, uh, and it's it's a pretty much impossible challenge to be competitive in that first year when you don't know the circuit. So that is yeah one one main reason why I did get that opportunity in 2001 with superbikes. So continuing on with your superbike career, I know I remember when you were with Fila Ducati. I was over in Europe with my parents at the time. So I remember that. And then you replaced Chris in 2006 on the Tenkata Honda, right? Yeah. Chris moved to MotoGP. You've replaced Chris. Then the following year, you became world champion, world superbikes for Honda, for Tenkata Honda. Can you talk us through that year? Well, that was, that. it was a bit of um, um, an emotional kind of roller coaster because I, I lost my job with Ducati. Fortunately for me, uh, Chris was moving to MotoGP and that opportunity became available. So I must thank Chris for that because if, if Chris would have stayed, <laughs> I would have maybe not had a chance of being a world champion again. And But when I joined Tenkate, um, I followed Chris Vermeulen around Laguna Seca in 2004 and he didn't put a foot wrong and he did the double. And I literally, I was on his exhaust pipe for the whole race. And... In 2005, uh, when I did get the opportunity to go to Tenkarte, I remembered that race. And I remembered how good that bike was in certain places around Laguna Seca. And even though it wasn't a factory team, because when you go from the factory Ducati team and World Superbike, everything else on paper looks like it's a little bit less uh, of an opportunity because they are the flagship, uh, especially with Tenkarte at the time, because they were very, very new to World Superbikes. I think... Uh, Chris was one of their first ever riders in, in Superbike Championship because they were successful in Supersport. So I had no idea. I'd, I'd ridden on twin cylinder bike uh, uh, all my career with Ducati. I'd never ridden a four cylinder bike. So there were so um, um, many uncertainties. But luckily, that one race in Laguna Seca, when I followed Chris, I remembered how good the bike looked. Uh, so that's what I took with me. And, and I joined the team, finished second to Troy Bayliss in 2006. Um, another bloody fast Australian. You was is a, a, a they're, they're, they're bloody awkward to beat, I tell you. Um, uh, and then I got the better of him, thankfully, in 2007, in my second year of Tenkarte. But two really amazing, memory, memorable years for me and to lift the crown with the satellite team as well uh, as being the underdogs kind of thing because everybody loves an underdog. And I got so much support for that. It was, it was incredible. Oh, that is such a cool story. I love that. Like the memories that you have, the sharing of that. I can feel the excitement when you talk about it. It's oh, so, so, so cool. So from then on, you went into MotoGP. And I know that not a lot of people understand what the main differences are between a world superbike bike, especially Tenkata not being a full factory, then jumping onto a MotoGP bike. So what was that experience like for you coming from essentially a production bike, right, with a few accessories on it, then to jumping onto a prototype that's got carbon brakes and different tires and all this electronics? How was that experience for you? It, it was incredible. But really, just personally for me, I was just so, so proud from a young younger guy um, in Sheffield in the north of England. Uh, with uh, with a, a a piano background that all of a sudden got on a motorcycle, and now in my very first race, I'm on the front row in second, and I've out qualified Valentino Rossi. Like, um, there's there's just a few moments in life where you kind of go, wow, um, you've done all right, and all of that effort, um, you get out what you put in, and there's just there's just some moments that uh, I will really really cherish because. I was lucky enough to work with some amazing people, amazing teams and ride amazing bikes to allow me with my dedication and focus and commitment to it to kind of um, achieve all of my childhood dreams. But without all of those uh, elements, it's it's impossible in life. And the two MotoGP years were really, really tough. Like I was saying, learning the tracks, 
the Yamaha at the time was 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 a little bit uncompetitive compared to, especially I was the satellite team with Tech Tech Four, and um, but I finished six kind of quite a lot most weekends, and to finish in the top six in MotoGP um, on uh, on a satellite bike, um, as you can still see these days, it's um, it's not bad going, and of course if I was on a factory Ducati or a factory Honda, then you know I would have been more competitive, but. Um, uh, if my auntie had wheels, she'd be my bike, as they say. And I, I don't like to live like that. And uh, I was given the opportunity that I was given, and I made the best of it. Just like with Super Sport uh, in, in in the UK, or the World Super Sport with Castrol Honda, or World Super Bikes, whatever I did, I made the best of it. And those two years, that was as good as it was going to get. Uh, but uh, I'll uh, I'll be really, I'm forever really proud of just even being able to kind of uh, race in MotoGP. I mean, you flew the flag for England for so long in MotoGP. I remember your um, blue and yellow leathers. I remember the big number 52 on the back. That's what stands out most for me when I think about you and your career. Just the proud that you should be so proud of yourself for what you've achieved. You just said before, oh, you know, I just did a little bit. You've done so much in your career, so you should really give yourself some credit. <laughs> but I heard in an interview that you did that there's a really cool story about working with Yamaha and your music background and your motorcycle background. And you played an event for Yamaha and Yamaha Music came and interacted. Could you tell us a bit about that? Yeah. Oh, yeah, there's, there's two really nerve-wracking stories when i first signed for yamaha motor gp the first one was i went to japan about three times to the to the music factory where literally where they manufactured the pianos and all the instruments and um they put a piano in the middle of the foyer of this huge yamaha music factory and i was to play a couple of songs for all the employers at the manufacturers of, of yamaha can you imagine i mean I mean, I, I, okay, I can play the piano, you know, I'm, I'm not so bad, but uh, I ain't no Lang Lang, you know, uh, like um, at all. So this was literally set in the middle of the foyer with all of the people that make them uh, and, and the Yamaha music boss. Uh, and I don't think I've ever been as nervous um, other than that, possibly that first race with Valentino Rossi in Qatar. Uh, that, was, that was the only other time. Um, but after that, because of that, when I did that and we had those meetings, I went to then Motegi in Japan to do MotoGP in 2008. And for the very first time, the Yamaha boss came to his very first motorcycle race because of that. And when he walked inside the garage, the Yamaha Japanese boss of the motorcycling uh, company was really, really bowing and respectful um, to, to the music boss because historically, Yamaha Music and the boss of that uh, brand gave his friend who wanted to start manufacturing motorcycles after the war, he wanted to have the Yamaha logo and brand with his motorcycles because he respected it so much. Um, so historically, Yamaha Music were the ones that gave uh, Yamaha Motorcycling the name. And if you look at Yamaha, the logo itself, the only two differences, slight differences in the logo, the middle of the M doesn't come to the bottom of the uh, of the bikes. It's slightly raised the middle of the M on the bikes compared to the music. And the, the logo is three tuning forks, so in a circle. And on the motorcycle, it, the tuning forks don't touch the circle. Uh, so they're, they're the two slight differences from, from the motorcycling and from the music, but uh, because of the history of it, when the when the boss of music walked in, it was like the uh, the uh, uh, yeah the uh, the god had walked in that gave him the name initially. It was it was uh, so I was very proud of that. That's so cool! Wow, what a story to be able to tell! Wow. So before we move on to your music career, which obviously you're so passionate about, there is uh, something that we need to talk about with regards to your racing career and why you're no longer continuing. I know that um, you did retire due to an injury that you sustained. You uh, damaged your wrist, correct? And now it's yeah. fused together from what I it heard. Is. Yeah. Okay, cool. So how... How has that been? Because I know retiring as a sports person, it's not never easy, right? It's it's your whole life. This was your career that you've done since you were a child. And then to go and have that completely taken away and, and figure out what's next. How was that journey for you? 
it was tough because losing my MotoGP opportunity, coming back to World Superbikes, that was tough because for the first time in my career, it had gone sideways, not not forwards. Um, so from 1997 until 2009, which is a long time, everything had been going uh, in, in the right direction. And then I lost that. So I was just getting over that when I went back to Superbikes with Yamaha. And then I joined BMW in 2011, sustained this injury uh, at Aragon, testing that winter. But I was only 29, 30 years old. And uh, as soon as I crashed, um, I knew something was was a bit awkward with the injury because obviously I've had plenty of injuries uh, in my time. But I knew something was a bit awkward with it because I couldn't move my wrist. And I didn't break anything, but I flipped the, the bones in the wrist. Um, and because of the damage, the ligament damage and everything else that that caused, because of that, um, I had to have a, a, an emergency operation because the blood flow could have stopped and it, I, I could the wrist could have been paralyzed within 24 hours. So I had emergency surgery that wasn't successful because the bones just settled in the wrong place because they were so disrupted in there. And it meant that the bones couldn't fold over each other. And then I was left with a wrist that didn't bend, the right wrist as well, which is obviously devastating for, for the motorcycle with the throttle. So um, it was um, it, it was a dark decade. I'll, I'll say that, you know, I, I was certainly not ready to retire. I thought I had um, at least a, another uh, five or six years where I could have been competitively racing for the championship in World Superbike still. And uh, it was a, a, a huge, uh, a huge adjustment uh, with 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 things you know waking up um, to have an opportunity to to be a world champion you can't underestimate just what of a goal and obsession and, and and focus that is in your life and when you don't have it it's a massive void to to fill uh, and I've, I've struggled to fill it you know I did my music and I did uh, did other things and kept myself busy but um, uh, and also motorcycle racing as well it was uh, it's a drug because the adrenaline is is addictive, and uh, it also is such an outlet for your emotions to to keep yourself balanced. So without flying around the racetrack at two hundred miles an hour, I didn't feel balanced either. And so with the frustrations and upset of not being able to do it, it was you know magnified by um, by emotional um, kind of uh, stress as well to get to 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 understand and. It kind of like the dust just needed to settle of the whole thing to actually find who you were without it. But I've never been without it. I was eight years old. So that's the problem with professional sportsmen and women. Uh, when they don't have that uh, focus in their life, it's, it's a really difficult transition to make uh, before you find yourself who you are without it. But like you said, you had your music. And so once you retired from racing, I know that you had a band, actually had a couple of bands. You had Crash, which was a cover mm -hmm. band. Yes. And then you mm -hmm. had Toesland. You are a recording artist. You've made music. So tell us about that. That sounds like an amazing <laughs> journey. <laughs> it is uh, completely different to motorcycle racing. I wouldn't say it's uh, um, as healthy as being a sportsman, <laughs> being in a rock band. <laughs> that, that's for sure. <laughs> but uh, but traveling around in a splitter van with five or six guys uh, traveling through Europe and in the UK, it was a blast. It really was. And it was really, really nice to kind of pursue what I wanted to pursue initially before bikes came in my life uh, to kind of see what that was about and to see um, what that lifestyle was able to provide me with fulfillment after losing my racing career. And it certainly did. Um, it, it filled it a certain way in a completely different way. And I struggled to enjoy some aspects of it because of it wasn't similar to, to my other life, but, but it, it was something that I was really, really proud of. I was really proud of the music that we created. I was really proud of the live performances that we were able to, 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 uh, to, to show. We, we supported Deep Purple um, in Germany and Italy. We supported The Darkness. We supported Reef. We supported um, uh, Aerosmith at the festival in Calling Festival. And um, to play in front of thousands and thousands of people with rock and roll music was was a real blast. I mean, I was a real rock fan because Queen was my favourite band when I first started getting into motorcycle racing. And you know what it's like in the motorcycle world. It's just rock and roll 
uh, you know, predominantly, isn't it? So it kind of went hand in hand with with bikes and rock. And, and I had a lot to shout about when I lost my job, or I lost my career with motorcycle racing. I was quite an angry guy. So it, it then gave me that outlet, like motorcycles did at high speed, rock and roll and playing loud music, energetic music was that like kind of uh, uh, release of uh, release of energy that's so cool I love that I love that you reinvented yourself you've gone from athlete motorcycle racer to rock star legend I love it right <laughs> before we finish up this interview we've only got a couple minutes left but I just wanted to ask you what's your favorite circuit that you've ever raced at or ridden at uh without doubt I mean brands hatch a lot some amazing memories because of the double I did there, my only double in World Superbikes. But if I, I'm going for an operation on the 8th of December in America for my wrist, it will be the 8th operation, and I'm really, fingers crossed, hope that this is a successful one. There's a new procedure out there that they don't do here in Europe, and I'm going to go for one more try, and he's hopeful of getting me 40, 50, 40 or 50% movement back in it and because there's no movement at all, and it hasn't moved for two or three years. So um, it's, a, it's, a, it's going to be a... A big thing i'm really nervous about having another operation on it again but i'm gonna do it and uh if i do get the movement back the one thing i would really love to do is ride around philip island again on whatever bike what doesn't matter what bike please if i get some movement back in my wrist i want to do a couple of laps around philip island all right because i will make sure philip, i'm there for that but philip island was the first place i went to from this country no I way. Went, I went, yeah, I went from Cadwell Park, Mallory Park, and Brands and Silverstone, right? But the first time I went outside the country was to test at Phillip Island. And I, on that long flight to Australia, and then landing the two hour drive down to uh, Phillip Island, and just it, being in the cafe at the front where the ocean is at se 17 years old, like it will forever be a beautiful, beautiful place and one of the best, uh, be most beautiful tracks in the world. Wow. Well, James, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me. It's been an absolute pleasure to hear your stories and your journeys. And I know that the future holds so much more for you. You're more than just a motorcycle racer and a rock star. So thank you again so, so, so much. Oh, bless you. Thanks very much.